Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Job. Now, if you're trying to find the book of Job, the book of Job is found just before the book of Psalms. So if you can find Psalms, Psalms is right there kind of in the middle of your Bible. Just go to the left, one book, and you're going to find yourself at the book of Job. And we're going to look at Job chapter 42, verses 7 through 10. This morning, we're going to talk for a few moments about the key to restoration. I believe there's not one of us in this room this morning that does not have a relationship of some level, whether it's the next door neighbor, whether it's been, you know, a little bit something going on over a lot line, or whether it's a brother that you're not speaking to, or a sister that's estranged, children that don't have any kind of relationship with you, and uh, you're looking for, what is the key? How can I go from where I'm at this morning, at this moment, where the relationship is at this moment, how can I get it back to a godly place and an enjoyable relationship once again? So we're going to talk this morning for a few moments about the key to restoration. And of all books of the Bible, we find here in the book of Job, I believe the key, and the key is going to be found in verse 10 when we get to it. But let's look at starting at verse 7. It says, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, Eliphaz the Temite, he says, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you. And I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Tamathite did what the Lord told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends... The Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now look at verse 10 one more time. It says, after Job had prayed for his friends. Now that after, it almost sounds like there's quite a distance in time there. After he was completed with his praying for his friends, a restoration came. But if you read this in the original Hebrew language here, the Hebrew is saying it is almost happening simultaneously. At the moment that Job prays for his friends, that is the very exact moment that a divine restoration starts to take place. You know, during my lifetime, I'm sure like you, we've all read the book of Job many, many times. I personally, I've read it devotionally. I've also read it, you know, theologically. And even read it in what we call a critical way, just line by line, verse by verse, trying to figure out what is this book all about. Yet in all of my many readings, I have to admit to you this morning that I never really took notice of this prayer tucked into the epilogue of the book that bears Job's name. A few months ago, while I was reading the book of Job once again, It was in that moment that this prayer seemed to just leap off the page. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. For the first time, I began to see the incredible importance of this prayer and the miraculous results this prayer brought both to Job and his restoration, but also for his three friends. Now, in the next few minutes this morning, what I want to do is I want you with me to consider Job's prayer and how his prayer is the key to restoration of relationships in our lives. Now, first of all, I want you to take notice this morning how this prayer of Job was born out of a time of great loss and heartache. You know, I think it's fair to say that of all the people that have ever walked the face of this earth, Job has probably suffered more than any single man you could ever think of. For poor Job, it rained and it poured multiple calamities, and he experienced what I would call a flood of calamity and trouble. 
In a space of just a few hours, this wealthy, healthy, godly, this man that was a family man, loving his family and home, he lost everything. First, it was his wealth, his oxen, his sheep, his donkeys. And as you read that, you know, it gets easy for us to say, well, that's just a bunch of cattle. Let's put it in modern context. In just a moment's time, he lost his savings account. He lost his 401k. They foreclosed on his home. Everything he had was gone in an instant. In a moment of time, this wealthy business mogul, which is one of the wealthiest in all the land, he lost everything. Financially, he was ruined in just a moment. Now, as bad as this is, it even gets worse for Job. All of his ten children, the Bible tells us, was gathered together celebrating at their eldest son's home. And I can imagine it was like a family reunion. Everyone was there. All ten children were all together. And they were either celebrating like a reunion or gathered together for a birthday party or some event. And the Bible says a tornado came out of nowhere, hit the house, and it collapsed on his family And all ten of his children instantly were taken from him. They all died. You know, that is not bad enough. He is smitten now with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Now, I think it would be fair to say that Job has been absolutely clobbered with problems. Financially, emotionally, and physically, he has been pounded. All that he has left is his wife. And when I say his wife, she is a real sweetheart. She is one that wrote the book on how to nag. And so he's only got one left of his family, of all of his children. They're all gone. His wealth is gone. His health is gone. And all he has left is his nagging wife. And she encourages him when he's at his lowest moment. Why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? That's a real wife in a time of trouble. And she is the one that comes alongside him and just saying, he's egging him on, just, why don't you just curse God? Call it quits. Pull the plug. Be done. God will kill you if you do so. But it even gets worse. Job's friends all begin to show up. He has three very close friends, and they show up, and they begin to make painful accusations. Now, upon hearing of Job's troubles, his three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, they came over to comfort him in his time of suffering. However, rather than bringing comfort to Job, they began to make untrue and unfair allegations about his relationship with God. You see, they were of the theological persuasion that horrible things only happen if a person has hidden sin in their life. But the Bible tells us as we start out in the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, that God himself said, there is nobody like Job on all the earth. He fears God. He's a good man. He's a righteous man. And in God's eyes, God declared Job to be a righteous and good man. But to these three friends that showed up, they thought it must be that there is hidden sin in the life of Job, and therefore God is allowing or God is causing these things to happen in his life. And I can just imagine them saying something like, Job, buddy, come on, friend, look at what you've gone through. And remember, God doesn't do this kind of judgment without there being some unconfessed sin in your life. Come on, Job, repent. It's time to come clean. Confess. Get right with God. These guys, with their half-truths and with their home-brewed religion, they accused Job of being a sinner and having hidden sin in his life. Their visit was like salt in a wound. Spiritual digs, I think we all have had them at some time or another, where someone makes their attack against us, not against how tall we are or the way we look or, you know, the home we live in or the car we drive or all of these kinds of things. The deepest digs that happen to us in our lives are the spiritual digs. When they say, well, I thought you were a Christian. And they 
began to rag on us about our relationship with God. And these spiritual digs, I believe they hurt worse than any other kind of accusation. Don't kid yourselves this morning. These friends, these three friends of Job, when they came over to his home and they began to accuse him, they hurt Job and they hurt him greatly. Now I want you to see the key to restoration. Job made a decision. And the decision that Job makes here is one that he's going to pray for his friends. And not only pray for his friends, but he is going to go beyond that. He is going to forgive his friends. Listen to what it says one more time. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. You know, the people we love are often the ones that hurt us the most. Yet as much as they accused Job in that hour of his grief, he still considered them to be friends. How oft times we write people off. How often we get so angry with them and, you know, we want nothing to do with them and we accuse them of being an enemy and to be a backstabber and all of these various phrases that we all know and know how to pull them out at the appropriate time. But for Job, Job considered these individuals, these three guys that had so hurt him still to be a friend. And he made up his mind. You see, to forgive and pray for those who have hurt us is a choice that we must make. Now, true forgiveness means three things. You know, oftentimes we talk about forgiveness, and we really, I think, have a shallow or a very poor understanding of what it means to truly forgive in a godlike way. First of all, to forgive means I will not mention this hurt again. You are forgiven. I will not bring this up. The next time when it seems as though you're repeating the old life and repeating some of the old things you've said about me or to me or one more time when I sense that maybe you're opposing me in some area, I will not mention the past hurts again. You are forgiven. Friends, this is how God forgives us. In Micah chapter 7 and verse 19, it tells us that when we come to God and ask for forgiveness, his forgiveness is so perfect and so complete that he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west, as deep as the deepest sea, and never brings it back and never rubs it in our face again. When God forgives, God forgives, and he never brings it up again. And so when Job makes this decision, and remember, forgiveness and to pray for someone is not just an automatic thing. It is a decision that each and every one of us make. And so Job made the decision, I will not mention this hurt again. I will not mention the fact that you railed against me, against my walk with God, against the way I spend my time, my life, my family, all of these things. I will not bring it up again. I will not mention this hurt again. Secondly, when we forgive, it means that I will not talk to anyone else about it. I will not complain to anybody. I will not bring it up and rehash it with anybody again. It is simply saying that once I offer forgiveness, from that moment on, I will not speak of it again to anyone else from this moment on. It is a done deal. The past is the past, and we're going to move on. We're not going to hang it somewhere on a hook where it's convenient for us to grab it next time we need it and say, you've done it again. So forgiveness means then I will not mention this hurt again. You are forgiven. I will not bring it up to you. I will not talk to anyone else about it. I will not complain to anyone. And I will not bring it up and rehash it with anyone again. I will not go to a friend and say, we wouldn't believe what they did. And then begin to tell the whole story over and over again and again. Forgiveness means you will not remember to bring it up and rub it in someone's face again. And thirdly, It means I will not talk to myself about it anymore. You know, I will not replay the situation over and over in my mind like a DVD 
And that is played over and over and over. You see, Job knew that for every action in life, there's also a reaction. In setting his friends free and forgiving them and praying for them, Job understood what was good for the friends was also going to have an effect on his life and that he was setting himself free at the very same time. You see, anger that is aimed at others Someone said it's like drinking poison and then standing there and watching and waiting for the other person to drop dead. It only harms us. Anger will destroy relationships. It will destroy our relationship with God. It will destroy our physical being, our emotional being. Anger aimed at others is like drinking poison and then expecting someone else to drop dead. Job trusted God enough to pray for his friends who had hurt him greatly. You know, when we look back in the Old Testament and in the book of Genesis, Exodus, you'll find so many examples of forgiveness, but especially in the life of Moses in the book of Exodus. You'll find in the book of Exodus, there was a day where they came and they confronted Moses. And they said to Moses, Moses, you have brought us out here in this desert to die. We were better off while we were in Egypt. I wish to God you would have just left us alone and left us be. And then they began to say, you think that God speaks to you only, Moses? We want you to know God can speak to us just as well as he can speak to you. And you're nothing special. And they began to rail against him and say, you're not a man of God. You're not leading us right. And all of these things, and I'm sure to a man that it you know, given up so much already to be the leader that God wanted him to be, that in that moment it hurt, and it hurt greatly. But Moses, here's what he said. There was a time when God was listening to the children of Israel, and and he said, listen, we're going to just take and wipe out the whole bunch. We'll start over with a new, with a new group, and we'll start out with people of faith and aren't going to act like this and won't uh, uh, be tearing down their leader and leadership and railing against you, Moses. And we'll just start all over. And Moses said, God, don't do this. He began to pray for them. God, do not do this. Matter of fact, Moses went on to say, if you're going to wipe their name out of the book of life, then take mine as well. If you're not going to take them into the promised land, then I am not going to go either. And so we find forgiveness modeled by Moses in a moment when everyone had turned against him. Just as it is in the case here of Job. His three friends come, and these three friends, let me tell you, these friends hurt him deeply. And remember, the ones that hurt us are the most, the most are those that we love the most and have walked the most closely in relationship with. And so we find in that hour, it was Job saying, I forgive. And not only will I forgive, I will pray. Moses, he forgave, and he prayed for the children of Israel. Think about Jesus on the cross. From the cross, he said these words, which you well remember, Father, forgive them, for they what? Know not what they do. Now, there are those that certainly know what they're up to. They intend to harm. They try their best to give their digs. But that individual is seldom the person that hurts us the most. The one that hurts us the most is probably the one that, you know, we love and care about and walk in relationship with, but they say something very careless. And rather than clarifying it right then and there and saying, what did you mean by that? We just allow it to begin to stir inside of us. And we walk away and we think, you know, how could they say such a thing? And it may have been an absolute, you know, uh, a misnomer of what we thought they said. But nonetheless, you know, we hold it against them. Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus practiced forgiveness and he prayed for those that had so abused him. Look at Job 42 and 10. One more time then. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. You know, this restoration started immediately. That after he had prayed, that's an interesting phrase there. 
And again, it means it's, it's simultaneous. While he's praying the prayer, God is at work restoring not only the relationship with his friends, he is restoring all that has been robbed away from him by the enemy, and he's going to receive back double for all that he had lost. So Job's friends, the Bible says, were forgiven their folly. God forgave them. God got them on the right path one more time. And Job's trial, the Bible says, his trial came to an end as he began to pray for his friends. Now, we need to understand that a failure to forgive those who hurt us only prolongs our agony. The longer we wait, the more sorrowful life gets, and the more sorrow and the more sour we become in life. Failure to forgive those that hurt us only prolongs the agony. Job, at that moment that he said, I forgive. And as he began to pray for his three friends that he had walked and had relationship with to the, to the point that when they knew that he was down, they wanted to come, and they were certainly not saying the right things. They were not speaking the right things about God. But nonetheless, they were friends that wanted to come to his aid. From that moment on, they were blessed. Their folly was forgiven. Job was doubly blessed. His wealth was doubled. His family doubled. He received an additional three daughters and seven sons. Job was blessed with another 140 more years of life. He was able to live and see four more generations of his offspring. And the key that released all of this blessing was Job's decision to forgive and to pray for his friends. Now let's look at our text one more time. Job 42 and verse 10, after. It wasn't before. It was after. After Job had prayed for his friends. After. One more time. After Job had prayed for his friends the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. This prayer of his was born in a time of loss and a time of heartache. It was born in a moment of painful accusations. But in the midst of it all, he decided the right thing to do and the best thing to do was to forgive And the key to restoration was found in the fact he prayed for his friends. And when the restoration came, not only was his friends restored, God forgave them their folly, but in addition to that, the relationship between Job and his three friends, they were restored, and Job, all that he lost, everything the enemy had robbed away, was returned back double. I'm so glad to know that God is still in the restoration business. And I'm so glad that when we make a decision and we say, you know, from this moment on, I am going to forgive and I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going to pray for my friends. There's not one of us in the room that at some point have not been injured that our spirit has not been crushed, that we've not felt the sting and the pain of someone that we cared about, somebody we loved, somebody that was a close friend, a family member, someone. But I would say that in this room, there's not one. And I would dare say that by the Spirit of God, there's not one of us in the room that does not have some area, some one whether it's a neighbor, a fellow employee, a past employer, a current employer, a former mate, a son, a daughter, someone that's done great harm to you. The longer you wait, the more sour you'll become. And I believe this morning is a great time, a great moment 
to not only forgive, but to go to the next step and pray the blessing of the Lord upon them. Because as you pray the blessing of the Lord upon them, what happened to Job? Job was what? Doubly blessed. And if you're looking for restoration, it's all available today. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If you're in the house this morning, you're saying, you know, there's, there's been some real stuff. It's caused me years even of anguish. And the sting has been deep. You've been hurt. Job was hurt. And it was by his friends. And you, up to this moment, you've considered them to be anything but friend. And God is saying, if you'll just take them back in, and if you'll forgive, and remember what forgiveness is, it's not a casual thing. It's very, very lasting. It's permanent. I'm going to release this thing. I'm not going to hold on to it any longer. I'm going to let the hurt go. It was real. It was intense. But I'm going to let go. Jesus, in John chapter 5, he comes upon a man that has been by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. He was an invalid. His daily routine was as his friends would pick him up on his mat and carry him to the pool of Bethesda. And the Bible says at the pool of Bethesda, there was a great crowd of impotent folk, meaning those that were lame and halt and unable to walk. It was quite a scene. And so Jesus comes to the pool of Bethesda. And there's a man there that had been there for 38 long years. And do you remember what question Jesus asked him? It almost sounds silly. Why in the world would you ask someone that had been 38 years by the pool of Bethesda? And the thought was at the pool of Bethesda, when the natural springs would begin to bubble up, they said that that was the angels stirring the water. And the first person into the pool, after the stirring of the waters, they would be healed. And so Jesus, knowing this man now, had been there for 38 long years, he asked him this question, do you want to be made well? You know why he asked him that? Because from that moment on, it was an entirely different lifestyle that was going to be required of him. He would have to get a job. No more all day long with his buddies around the pool, waiting for the waters to bubble up. No more with a tin cup. No more just gathering together and commiserating with others of how bad life is and how hard things are. And so Jesus said, do you really want to get well? And I believe that he's asking that question this morning. Do you really want to get well? Do you really, truly want to move forward? Do you want to be restored? And if so, here are the keys, the key of forgiveness and the key of prayer. And watch what happens after he prayed. God restored everything. So if you're ready for restoration, somewhere of your life, you're saying, I'm not walking out of here today without taking care of business. I'm not going to carry this thing any longer. I was speaking at a Women's of Glow conference up at Green Lake, and uh, at the conclusion of the service that day, there was testimonies of individuals that had been set free, and God had done some wonderful things that day. And one lady came up, and she said this. She said, as I was standing here today, I felt like God showed me. She said, I don't even want to call it a vision, but, but I saw in my mind's eye I saw that I, along with all of you, were dressed in white. Remember, we're the bride of Christ. And she said, in this vision, this, you know, this scene she had in her mind, she said, all of us had long trains behind our garments. And as we'd walk, this train 
like a king's train or a wonderful, beautiful train on a wedding dress. It was long and it followed long behind and it was white and beautiful. But as the bride was walking, people started stepping on, on the train. And then there was two, and then there was three, and they got on with dirty feet. And I mean, the picture was just barely being able to, to move this long train, all of these people standing on it. He said, Lord, what is this? What is it that I'm seeing in my mind's eye? Why? What is this? long train, all these people, dirty feet, mud all over the train. And God said, you're so tired because you're dragging your past behind you. And every time you run into one of those situations, like Job with his three friends, three jump on board. And after a while, we just get feeling like we're just barely, I mean, it's work just to move an inch. And you're just every day trying to pull along. If you're tired of dragging all this behind you, and this is the day, this is the moment that I believe God, as he did in the first service, he's going to do it for you as well. As they begin to sing, as you get up and as you rise and come down to this altar, on your way down, there's going to be, as he began to pray, in the moment he began to pray, the moment you began to move, I believe God's going to begin to restore and you're going to see the hand of God and you're going to notice a difference starting this morning and God is going to restore and he's going to give you back all the enemy has robbed away. If it's family, he's going to give them back. If it's friends, he's going to give it back. Whatever the enemy has robbed away, God is going to say, devil, give it back to him. And you give it back twofold. And I want you to come as they begin to sing. Just rise up and come to this altar.